Xbox has been around for over two decades, and in that time, they have shifted dramatically time and time again in their approach to their own philosophy on exclusive titles for their console. And things have changed quite a bit from what it looked like at the very beginning. But what if we went year to year and looked at every single exclusive game that has ever released across Xbox and see how things have changed and maybe what has led Xbox to the state that they're in more or less today. A few ground rules we have to set up though. For the sake of this video, we're not going to be talking about small indie games unless they're like super notable or they have some sort of story around them. We'll be skipping the Connect titles because that kind of was its own separate entity from like the core Xbox experience, but we will talk about it when we get to that year. And lastly, if an Xbox game also released on the PC through Xbox's Play Anywhere initiative, we'll still count that as an Xbox exclusive as long as it's not released on like PS4 or Nintendo Wii U or something like that. That being said, let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna have to start at the very beginning of Xbox's life in 2001 when the Xbox actually released. Now in 2001, Xbox would see 14 titles released in the short span of that holiday. Obviously the biggest title to come to the Xbox was at its launch, Halo Combat Evolved. This game obviously put Xbox on the map. It revolutionized first person shooters. And I think the fact that it had co-op split screen available day one helped get a lot of people who maybe wouldn't have been interested in picking up an Xbox to at least try Halo out when they're at a friend's house or something and realize how cool of a game it was before wanting to get their own Xbox. This would later build into the birth of Halo LAN parties. There truly was no other game like this, and if Halo Combat Evolved did not release as a launch title for the Xbox in the state that it was, the Xbox probably would have had a much harder time getting started. But besides Halo, there were 13 other titles released in that short period of November, December 2001. There were some game studios willing to kind of put their game on the line in hopes to get a more exclusive audience, being some of the earliest adapters going onto the Xbox. Dead or Alive 3 would come out, and exclusive version of Tony Hawk with Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2X would release. There was even an exclusive Star Wars game in Star Wars Obi-Wan, which was interesting to have a game based on a movie franchise as big as Star Wars appear on this brand new console. And man, that box art went so hard. It's got that like Xbox green, but like Obi-Wan's in it. And you're like, is that like Qui-Gon's lightsaber? What's going on here? It was a very interesting time. NFL Fever 2002 release, which is interesting that there was a NFL game franchise back then that was before before the Madden days of NFL video game monopolies. There were a few interesting racing games like Mad Dash Racing, and Microsoft Game Studios helped publish a new game in a franchise that was originally supposed to be a Sega Dreamcast series in the first ever Project Gotham Racing, or PGR. There was Amped Freestyle Snowboarding, Bloodwake, Nightcaster, and interestingly enough, Azuric Rise of Herathia, another Microsoft published game, was a game title that Microsoft thought maybe would be its big flagship mascot type game. It wasn't. Halo ended up taking that title. But when 2002 rolled around and Halo was officially under Xbox's belt, the first console wars between Xbox, Nintendo, and PlayStation would commence. And at least Xbox was being taken somewhat seriously because Halo was hugely successful. 2002 also saw the launch of Xbox Live, which would be a very big deal for the Xbox ecosystem moving forward. And in 2002, Xbox came out swinging with 32 titles that were at the time exclusive for just the Xbox. Blinks the title. Time Sweeper would have been another consideration for a major mascot-like character under Microsoft. This character is often forgotten about today. There were some interesting titles like Bruce Lee, Quest of the Dragon, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. We also saw the releases of Crimson Sea, Death Row, and Gun Valkyrie, Metal Dungeon, Nightcaster 2, Equinox, New Legends, and Phantom Crash would all release. Panzer Dragoon Orta would be an interesting title to release and kind of developed a little bit of a cult following later on. Driving fans got Chase Hollywood Stunt Driver, Pulse Racer, and Sega GT 2002. Sports fans, on the other hand, got NBA Inside Drive, NFL Fever 2003, UFC Tap Out 2002, and Championship Manager 2002-2003. Jet Set Radio Future would release exclusively on the Xbox, and this would actually end up being the highest rated Xbox exclusive game of all 2002, and it ended up rating number 10 overall, which is a pretty big deal. But that wasn't all there was in 2002. 
2002, we had Kakudo Chojin, Back Alley Brutal, Quantum Redshift, Sea Blade, Superman the Man of Steel, Toe Jam and Earl 3, Mission to Earth, Toxic Grind, Trans World Snowboarding, Unreal Championship, and Whacked. We also saw Mech Assault, which was one of the first games on Xbox that you'd be able to play through Xbox Live. You could find and create online matches. There was even some quick match options, but also there was some forms of skill-based matchmaking called Optimatch in there as well. Also, Steel Battalion, which is notable for having some of the most expensive collector editions back in the day. This came with this huge flight controller. It would set you back like $200, but honestly, it looks pretty awesome still. By 2003, Xbox would slow down in the amount of exclusive games coming to the platform. It seemed like they were getting some more heavy third-party support, so it does make sense that they would have tried to front load the system's life with as many exclusives. So from here, the exclusives get a little bit interesting, specifically 2003. There were some games like Blackstone, Magic and Steel, Brute Force, Cat, Cyber Attack Team. We got a sequel to Crimson Skies and High Road to Vengeance. We got Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball. But we had Dino Crisis 3, Dungeons and Dragons Heroes, Grabbed by the Ghoulies, which was interesting because this was Xbox's first game after acquiring Rare, where now they were making exclusives for Xbox and not Nintendo. There was Group S Challenge, Hunter the Reckoning, Redeemer. You could get your bowling on in AMF Bowling. There was an Amped 2. There was a Kung Fu Chaos. Yo, if you were a hardcore gamer, you know you had Lynx 2004. There was also Loons the Fight for Fame, Maximum Chase, Midtown Madness 3, and Nude the natural ultimate digital experiment, which still to this day, I don't fully understand what this game was. There was Murakumo Renegade Mech Pursuit, another NFL fever game. There were two Otagi games released in the same year, Myth of Demons and Otagi 2 Immortal Warriors, a sequel to Project Gotham Racing in PGR2 actually released, and this would end up being the highest rated exclusive game and number eight of overall Xbox original games for 2003. There was also Racing Evolution, Luzion, Steak, Fortune Fighters, Tao Fang, Fist of the Lotus, and some fighting games like UFC Tap Out 2 and WWE Raw 2. 2004 saw even less exclusive titles than the year before, but it didn't matter. They had Halo 2 coming out this year. Halo 2 was a really big deal from a campaign side of things because it featured Master Chief and that lizard character exploring the galaxy together. It also had an incredible multiplayer experience that was both competitive and social. It would become the highest rated Xbox game of 2004 and the second exclusive game to also be the highest rated Xbox game of the year, which is after Halo Combat Evolved had done that in 2001. There were some interesting exclusives though that also came out in 2004, like Blinks 2, Masters of Time and Space. Microsoft really wanted Blinks to be their mascot and I don't think it was working. There was a game called Bicycle Casino. How have I never heard of this? There was also Breakdown, Carve, Dance Dance Revolution, Ultra Mix 2. There was Dancing Stage Unleashed. I think this was right when like the at-home dancing craze thing started to happen. Dead or Alive Ultimate came to the Xbox. There was Galleon. There was Mech Assault 2 Lone Wolf. There was Rally Sport Challenge 2 Silent Scope Complete. There was another Steel Battalion game in 2004's Line of Contact. But we can't forget Greg Hastings Tournament Paintball. Woo baby, did this game go hard. There was also a Virtual Pool Tournament Edition and Yu-Gi-Oh! The Dawn of Destiny. 2004 also was a really big deal. Xbox Live actually surpassed 1 million subscribed users, which was a pretty huge deal for an online service you had to pay for. 2005 marked the year that the Xbox 360 released, but there still would be titles coming to the original Xbox in the form of 15 exclusives, just for the OG Xbox. They finally did Conquer Live and Reloaded, which was a remaster of that classic N64 Conquer's Bad Fur Day. It even added multiplayer functionality, which was kind of interesting. There were some other games like Classified, The Sentinel Crisis, Far Cry Instincts came out, Dance Dance Revolution, Ultra Mix 3. Forza Motorsports released in 2005 on the OG Xbox, and this was the first Forza game, which is still a franchise that's going strong today, and even had the whole spinoff with Forza the Horizon. There was an exclusive Tom Clancy game in the form of Ghost Recon 2 Summit Strike. Ninja Gaiden Black released on the Xbox and that was another exclusive that became one of the highest rated Xbox games of all time. There was Raises Hell. I never played this one. <laughs> Spike Out Battle Street. Wow. Tech 
Tecmo Classic Arcade. We saw the releases of Torque Prehistoric Punk, Unreal Champion 2, The Leandri Conflict, WWE WrestleMania 21, America's Army Rise of a Soldier, which was like a military propaganda game, which would later get a sequel in the 360, and then the flagship game of 2005, Fable, which would be an exclusive for about a year before it was like released on Windows as well, but it was another Xbox franchise that would kick off a series and then it would kind of go dormant for a while, but it became relevant again more recently. So it is interesting to see that the origins of Fable started all the way back on the OG Xbox in 2005. Now the OG Xbox would be killed off in 2006, but there were a handful of exclusive games still released. There was Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Critical Hour, Far Cry Instinct's Evolution, and Zionide, which was the last exclusive released on the original Xbox, which was in August of 2006. But now let's go back a year to 2005 again and look at the Xbox 360 as it launched its console one year before Nintendo and PlayStation would launch their next generation console. So having a head start in 2005 and most of 2006, in that first few months of the Xbox 360 being out, there were eight exclusive titles just for the 360. There was Amped 3, that was the flagship game. Not really. Perfect Dark Zero actually was most likely the biggest Xbox 360 game to launch. It was a highly anticipated prequel to the very popular Perfect Dark game from the Nintendo 64 era. Remember, Perfect Dark served originally as like a spiritual sequel to GoldenEye, one of the biggest games on the N64. So the bar was set high with Perfect Dark Zero. I don't think the game was perfect, but you know what? For 360 players back in the day, it had co-op campaign, it had some multiplayer, it kind of was a mess, but it existed. There was Dead or Alive, 4. There was another rare game, Cameo Elements of Power, which kind of went under the radar of a lot of players, but ended up being a pretty good game. We got Project Gotham Racing 3, which would be the second highest Xbox game of 2005 after Call of Duty 2. There was also Ridge Racer 6, FIFA 06, and only in Japan, there was a game called Every Party, which was a Japanese exclusive board game I didn't know existed. Okay, but 2006, Xbox had to show that they were the definitive game game console that you would want to buy, so they upped the amount of exclusives this year to 19 exclusive games. Starting things off, there was Blue Dragon, which likely could have had the potential to be a massive franchise. It just never really caught on and had a few shortcomings, but I think there's like a big cult following around this game if I understand correctly. There was Bomberman Act Zero, which is probably the worst Bomberman game to ever release. It features like these hyper-realistic graphics for some reason. I mean, look at the characters. It's like they're trying to mix Iron Man, Samus, and Master Chief together. There's a game called Chrome Hounds that also released, and also Cold Sept Saga. We did get Dead or Alive Extreme 2, which was cool, and then Far Cry Instinct's Predator, which was kind of like the alternative version of Far Cry that released on the original Xbox, but this was the 360 version. There was another game called Full Auto, but Gears of War would be the most recognizable game to come out in 2006. This was the console seller in 2006. This was why people picked up the Xbox 360, because it was the next big competitive shooter title and Gears of War won a ton of players over back in the day. We also saw the release of MotoGP 06, Spectral Force 3, One Chanbara Bikini Samurai Squad. We had Kengo, Legend of the Nine, Project Silefeed, Tenchu Z, Over G Fighters, The Outfit 99, Nights. There was even this game called The Covenai 200X. It was like a Japanese exclusive Xbox 360 game where you manage like a 7-Eleven type convenience store. It's like a top-down 2D game. I don't know what I'm looking at. Also at this time, it's worth noting there wasn't a game like Grand Theft Auto available on the Xbox 360 just yet. And this is where Saints Row, a game that was kind of like an open world Grand Theft Auto inspired game, but also was kind of like a soft parody of the Grand Theft Auto games. This game would release and and spin off into its own massive franchise, and it definitely capitalized on the fact that there wasn't a Grand Theft Auto game. This was the next best thing, and I think that the publishers took opportunity of that, and that's why Saints Row 1 was exclusive on Xbox. Do you guys remember how big of a deal, though, Viva Pinata would be? This spun off into, like, a couple of games, and I think a TV series at one point. This became hugely popular. Also in 2006, we saw the launch of the HD DVD player. So if you bought that, 
you could watch all your HD DVDs. Okay, but 2007 was go time. They released new Xbox 360 revisions in the form of the Xbox 360 Arcade Edition and the Xbox 360 Elite Edition. 2007 also showed 15 new exclusive titles coming to the game console. We had Ace Combat 6. How are there six of them already? Then there was America's Army, True Soldiers. It was that sequel propaganda type game. There was Beautiful Katamari, Crackdown released in 2007 and kind of was a sleeper hit. I don't think too many people knew what they were getting into with Crackdown and I think the fact that if you bought Crackdown you had access to the Halo 3 beta made some people pre-order that game and be like yeah I, I'm gonna try this game. And then the game ended up being okay. We saw a much anticipated sequel to Forza Motorsport in the form of Forza Motorsport 2. There was Kingdom Under Fire Circle of Doom that released in 2007. Another Viva Pinata game released and then there was Fusion Frenzy 2. Okay then Halo 3 released in 2007. Obviously the biggest Xbox 360 release at its time. It was a huge deal. It was the highest rated Xbox exclusive of the year. This game's launch was probably one of the biggest video game launches of all time just with the amount of anticipation and excitement. So it was really impressive that this game finally was here two years into the Xbox 360's life without it. Also 2007 had Lost Odyssey release. Naruto Rise of a Ninja came out. Project Gotham Racing 4 finally released in 2007 and this game was kind of fun actually. I think when I finally got an Xbox 360 in 2008 this game was bundled with my 360 so I played it quite a bit to pick up some achievements. There was Tetris Evolution and Diario Rebirth Moon Legend which was another Japanese exclusive Xbox 360 game. I always was under the impression that the Xbox didn't sell well in Japan which I don't think it did but it did get some exclusive titles out there. Okay I think by 2008 things were changing internally at Microsoft and Xbox with how they felt about their console and what they were wanting to do moving forward. As far as Xbox 360 versus the PlayStation 3 at this point, Xbox had been killing it. They were like, we got this on lock. However, nobody expected Nintendo to just come out of the blue with the Wii and just kind of blow sales completely out of the water. Also, a lot of third party games were doing really well, like Guitar Hero was super popular. So I think Xbox was trying to find a new angle now to try to compete more with capturing a larger audience since they were kind of beating out PlayStation pretty well at this point. And they cut back on their exclusive games pretty substantially by 2008. There was only 10 exclusive games this year. First, there was Don King Presents Prize Fighter, Fable 2, which was a very notable Xbox release because the first one was pretty popular and now it was finally on the 360. There was even the spin-off game that released the same year that was part of the arcade game, so we're not counting it for this video. But yeah, Fable 2 was a huge game. It also supported co-op, which a lot of games like this never support co-op, so this was really cool to see. There was a lot of excitement about Ninja Gaiden 2 with how popular the first one was on the old Xbox, and now there was a follow-up game finally coming to the Xbox 360. Gears of War 2 was seeing another exclusive in 2008, one of the highest rated Xbox exclusive games. This game was pretty much as popular as the first one, but also got a lot of fans hooked in, and then they added, I think, this horde mode to it, which was also really popular right at the peak of horde modes being introduced in games. It was one of the first ones to do it well in this like wave survival type setting. Xbox 360 also had lips and a lot of these would come out. Uh, I guess this was Xbox's answer to SingStar lips. There was Naruto The Broken Bond, another Viva Pinata game released. Raiden Fighter Aces came out. There was a Seen It game, box office smash that only came out to Xbox for some reason. Two Human released in 2008. We also saw Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts. What a game. Everybody had wanted to see Rare return to their roots and create something more in line of what they were known for back from the N64 days. So finally a Banjo-Kazooie game was really exciting. Except the game didn't play anything at all like a Banjo-Kazooie game. So that really was upsetting for fans of the older games. Now some players were able to get into this game as its own concept with the whole vehicle building mechanics. And from that perspective, sure, the game was fine, but it wasn't a Banjo-Kazooie game that fans had expected. So this game didn't perform well enough and they never followed it up again, ever. And then there was another Japanese exclusive game called Mobile Ops The One Year War, which was supposed to be released in the US, but that ended up getting scrapped, only released in Japan exclusively on the 360. It's interesting, it's like a Gundam type game, but it's mostly in a battlefield type style. You like walk around as a soldier and get into vehicles in Gundam during the match. So obviously 2008, Microsoft was relying on their heavy hitter games instead of having quantity, but they did get Netflix to come out on the Xbox, which was the first 
console to get Netflix as a streaming service. They also introduced a new Xbox 360 that had a 60 gigabyte hard drive in it, which was the first for its time. 2009, we saw Zune get added to the Xbox store. Yeah. 2009 only saw the release of six exclusive games that Microsoft had been able to sign on for the Xbox 360. That's wildly low compared to every other year the Xbox had been around. I think Microsoft working on the Kinect at this time was maybe getting a little overconfident in the console wars race. If you guys don't know the outcome, Xbox 360 was leading against PlayStation by a substantial amount at this point, and I don't think they're expecting PlayStation to make such a meteoric return and dramatically catch up to Xbox's sales, but it might have something to do with the fact that Xbox was already slowing down the amount of exclusives that they were signing on with. There was a Forza Motorsport 3, which was the highest rated exclusive of that year. There was a game called Magna Carta 2 that released. Halo Wars did release at the beginning of 2009. It was intended for 2008, but it had gotten pushed back a little bit. It was the first Halo spinoff game ever, and that was kind of interesting. And then later on that year, Halo 3 ODST came out in September of that year. It sold moderately well, but it did result in explosive populations on the Halo 3 multiplayer side of things once again, since ODST included Halo 3's multiplayer. There was also Infernal, Hell's Vengeance, and Konami Classics Volume 1 and 2. Now, for this video, we said we weren't going to include arcade games, but there were like two separate disc releases featuring three arcade games like Contra, Castlevania, and Frogger from Konami in each volume, and while the game themselves are kind of on other platforms, they were bundled like this for the Xbox 360, so we're going to count it here. I mean, look at him. Xbox 360 needed any when they could get. Okay, maybe they were cutting back on their games because they were preparing for 2010, which was supposed to be the biggest year for Xbox 360. And while they might have made a lot of money in 2010, I think they ended up hurting their reputation more with how they handled 2010 overall. 2010 marked the big revision to the Xbox 360 in the new Xbox 360S. They also revealed the Kinect, which would be coming out that holiday season. And they like went big on their promotion budget for this app. On. So the Kinect released, there were a lot of Kinect games that came out, like a lot. So we're not going to talk about all of them because I feel like Kinect is kind of like its own entity for this video. We might mention one or two, but I want to focus on what this experience was like for console players who didn't care about the Kinect and what they had to look forward to. And in 2010, for exclusives, they got six games. <laughs> Crackdown 2, which fair enough was pretty highly anticipated after the first game. I remember some friends getting really excited about this game coming out. Out, so that was cool. And then of course, Halo Reach, which was very, very much highly anticipated. It was Bungie's final Halo game that they were going to work on before going off and working on some other game that would be on PlayStation and Xbox one day. We finally saw a sequel to 99 Nights in the form of 99 Nights 2. Then Fable 3 released, and that was a very big win when it came to exclusives for that holiday season. Fans have been wanting another Fable game. They didn't expect it to be this soon after Fable 2. Too, but it was a welcome addition. There were some big improvements, making the game probably the biggest version of Fable ever seen. And then there was Naval Assault, The Killing Tide. Also, I'm just gonna say this, Sonic Freeriders, it was a Kinect game. I know we're not talking about Kinect games, but man, this was like the worst thing <laughs> ever released. We have like a whole channel where we talk about Sonic stuff. If you like Rocket Sloth or you've watched us for a while, maybe check out our Sonic channel as well. There'll be a link in the description down below. It's called Rocket One. So yeah, I guess technically, if you were looking at 2010 from a bird's eye view, you would see the list look way longer than six games, but between 2010 and 2012, they literally released 30 Kinect games that were exclusive, obviously, so it really inflated the numbers quite a bit. Okay, then 2011, there were five regular games that would release. Blackwater, Forza Motorsports 4, kind of the crutch of Xbox, because they were releasing these pretty frequently, and then of course, there was the highly anticipated big finale, Gears of War 3, which was the end of the trilogy. I remember the hype was was real for this game and it mostly lived up to the hype. The campaign was really good and some people were really sad about that campaign. And then Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary, a 10 year special anniversary with fresh graphics over the campaign and a multiplayer experience that was in Halo Reach. It was just Reach DLC really, but you'll buy it anyways. To be fair, 2011 did add some new things though, like cloud storage was added and uh, obviously the Connect and Bing integration was a really big deal. 2012 was a big year. We had four total games that were not connected 
Connect games. Another Forza game in the form of Forza Horizon, which to be fair was a spin-off and it was the start of a kind of a brand new approach to racing games. This would end up becoming really popular in its own right. So it is a fair thing. It's just funny that it was another Forza game. Halo 4, which actually was the biggest selling Halo game at its time, but for some fans marked the death of the series. It was the first Halo game not made by Bungie. The story was very, very heavy compared to anything ever seen before. And the multiplayer was quite a bit different, trying to emulate some aspects of more modern first person shooters like Call of Duty. And I think a lot of the fan base just really didn't care for it. There was also Joyride Turbo. Yep, this is on the list. 2012 was the final full year of the Xbox 360 before the Xbox One were released and it got the live event viewer added where you could watch like concerts and stuff live I guess it was kind of neat then in 2013 we saw the final months leading up to the Xbox One's release the biggest game for the Xbox 360 side of things definitely was Gears of War Judgment which was a spin-off which was set before the first game it wasn't made by the original people I think for the most part a lot of people didn't feel like it was a bad game but it definitely felt like a very different game than what they had expected from a Gears of War game 2013 also would mark the introduction of games with gold and motocross madness which was an exclusive would release and was a games with gold game also state of decay this game was kind of a hybrid arcade type game but it would launch into a full series so we're counting it here but it released in june just a few months before the xbox one and it was popular at its time but it was interesting that it didn't get ported into the xbox one all the way until 2015 maybe it would have been a really good launch title for the xbox one but you know microsoft wasn't caring about exclusive or anything at this point. 2013 was also the launch of the Xbox One and it would have to, you know, hit out of the gate strong and they had five exclusives at launch. Not a big number compared to the original Xbox, but let's at least see what they had. Well, they had Forza Motorsport 5, which, all right, fair enough. It's a Forza game. Those seemingly sell well. Dead Rising 3 was a highly anticipated game, though I don't think Dead Rising 3 lived up to the expectation fans had for it. Rise of Son of Rome, this might sound really weird in how I'm saying this, but I felt like it was overhype when it was announced and then after it released it was underappreciated and it fell somewhere in the middle of how that game actually was. Zoo Tycoon was a game that definitely was not nearly as good as the older Zoo Tycoon games and this was the game that I bought at launch in 2013 when I got an Xbox One. What was I thinking? And then there was a Killer Instinct game, which great, we got a Killer Instinct game on the Xbox One. That's it for 2013 though, five games. But 2014 would be a full year. 2013 was only like two months. What can they put out in just two months for the Xbox One? 2014 would obviously prove different. For the whole year they released five more games, seriously. Okay, so they had Sunset Overdrive, which people do say this was a hidden gem. I could never get into the game, but I can see why some people really did enjoy it. It was a full-fledged polished exclusive, so there's that. Forza Horizon 2, a strong sequel for people that did like Forza Horizon, so it was cool to see this on the next generation of consoles at the time, or I guess the new current generation at the time. Project Spark. Now this was a game that was hyped up, like a game of creation that would have some of the biggest customizable features that ever existed. It was supposed to be a mix of like Roblox and Halo Forge, and nobody cared, and then they shut the game down less than two years later. They really were desperate with this game too. They did that whole like conquer the squirrel tie-in, even though we never got a conquer the squirrel game, which fans probably would have much rather played. Oh, and we had Dance Central Spotlight. That's great. And then Halo the Master Chief Collection, a very ambitious title, a console selling title for sure. Halo 1, 2, 3, 4, all right there with the multiplayers, a remastered Halo 2 with a separate multiplayer tied onto that. What more could you ask for? I guess a working game is too much to ask for. The game did not work at launch. It was one of the worst launches in video game history ever. This was like a very, very, very hard hitting truth so many Halo fans had to face with how terribly functioning MCC was. It was both incompetent releases and post releases with support afterwards not being good for a long time. And they finally came around like three and a half years later and decided they were gonna try to fix it up. And that took a couple of years still too. It was really rough. Also, while we were doing research for this video, Luke found this article where Xbox wrote 
wrote it about themselves, about their awesome 2014 lineup. It reads, Xbox delivers winning lineup of exclusive games for this holiday season. So they're just kind of giving themselves a medal for their list of games that they had in 2014. All right, 2015. They got to realize they need to turn things around here, right? So last year and the year before that, they only had five exclusives. What are they going to give us in 2015? Well, they did up the ante. They did six exclusives. <laughs> Halo 5 Guardians, essentially Death of the Halo series, the sequel coming out of MCC. They had a strong working game for the multiplayer side of things, but the campaign was pretty lackluster. And I think uh, the advanced movement and multiplayer didn't help too much. Forza Motorsport 6. I guess this franchise is a yearly thing. We're either getting a main Forza game or a Horizon on alternating years. And um, they were definitely going to keep doing that. So we had Forza Motorsport 6. Gears of War Ultimate Edition. It was a remake of the first Gears of War game. It was actually super cool that they did a remake. So that was one good thing that came out. Rise of the Tomb Raider. Now this is interesting. In 2013, with the Tomb Raider franchise being rebooted, this game was the sequel to that, a game that was on the PS3 and Xbox 360, but Xbox swooped in and got the follow-up as a timed exclusive for a year. So they had that. Okay, then Rare Replay, which was really hype in a way because it showed that it would bring some of the best Rare titles all in one place. It brought in a lot of classic games, which mind you were already on the arcade on the Xbox 360, but also some games that weren't. And it was all in one place with a little theater and some history. That was awesome and all. It kind of made you miss those days where Rare actually made games. And that was also sad. Though we did kind of get hinted at that they'd be working on a new game, so people were looking forward to that. But it still wasn't anything like their older days. And then Ori and the Blind Forest. It's an arcade game, but we definitely count it because it became hugely popular. It was a selling point for some people, and they did really, really like this game. Okay, things maybe get better in 2016. Oh, we're back to down to... <laughs> Five titles. All right. Gears of War 4 with a new take on Gears of War, just a follow-up game, bringing up some new character arcs because Gears of War 3 kind of wrapped things up. It's always going to be hard to capture the feeling that the old games had, but at least it was something for the Gears of War fans to have. Forza Horizon 3. Another Forza Horizon game, okay. ReCore. Interesting. This game looked like a triple A big budget game, and they did this cool cinematic trailer when they first showed it off, but really it was just like like a arcade platformer. It really wasn't like big, big, like it originally was revealed. We also saw Quantum Break, which was made by the people who made Alan Wake and Dead Rising 4, another Dead Rising game right here on Xbox One. 2017, five more titles. Halo Wars 2, for years, a lot of people were hoping that we would get a follow-up to Halo Wars, but that studio that made the first one shut down. And look, 343 brought another studio in to make this one and it was okay. The story and the cutscenes are cool. And I think people who like those type of games like this game. Just didn't really scratch the itch for the people who were in love with the FPS games. Another Forza game with Forza Motorsport 7. Cuphead released, which kind of started as an indie game, but became very popular with DLC expansions down the road. It definitely evolved more into a bigger game than just an indie title, but it was exclusive on Xbox and I think it came on PC too at that time simultaneously, but it wasn't on PlayStation or Nintendo, Wii U or Switch at the time. So it eventually did go over to those though. And then another indie game that they kind of promoted as a big match of games, Super Lucky's Tale, but it was just a smaller studio that became a first party studio. More of a double A project than a full blown triple A massive project. And then Sea of Thieves, which nowadays is in a much better place than it was when it first started, but the game launched in a kind of weaker place. It was a very bare bones game that just had very beautiful water physics, a lot of potential, and a lot of cool social interactions, but there wasn't a whole lot to do. But once again, the game did evolve a lot over time. All right, 2018, we had Forza Horizon 4, State of Decay 2, which at least was a follow-up to the first State of Decay, and it looked a lot bigger in scope than what the first one was, so that was cool. And we had Ash. All right, 2019, Gears 5, sweet. They saw Gears of War 4 didn't get that much interest and they kind of tried to mix up the formula a bit. They even dropped a war because, you know, the people on the streets and online would just say, hey, you want to go play Gears? So this time they were like, Gears 5. And they called Gears 5 like a mix with a semi-open world type feel, but I don't know if that ever was fully the case. It did have a cool like expansion mode that would come out and there was a lot of support for this game and the multiplayer scene at least lived for a bit. It definitely didn't end up being the end all be all Gears games, but Gears 5 did have a good reputation for a while and who knows, maybe that perfect formula could still come back. I think overall Gears 5 still was a general win though. We got another Ori game, Ori and the Will of Wisps. It was much bigger than the previous title and fans seemed to like that 
Silent Hill, Bleeding Edge released, and then one of the biggest games Microsoft had been teasing for a while, Crackdown 3. This was in development hell for a long time. It was supposed to be released in 2016, it was delayed to 2017, and then it was delayed to 2018, and then, you know, it got released in here in 2019. Uh, the game itself was kind of meh. Nobody really cares all this time later because the reputation this game had, and the game, to a lot of fans, felt like a downgrade from Crackdown 2, despite how many years of development this game was in. Xbox had really, at this point, obviously shifted in less of trying to make games and more trying to market games, I guess. But yeah, it seems like with the Xbox One's life, exclusives definitely took the backseat compared to the older days of Xbox. We did have Game Pass introduced, which was a pretty big deal, and then they would later roll out Xbox Cloud, which was another great service. 2020, that was the year the Xbox Series X and Series S released, the next generation, though most games released on the Series X and S would also release on the Xbox One. So let's look at what they really hyped up for 2020. Grounded. Uh, this technically didn't get its full release until 2022, but early access started in 2020. And I think people did come around to this game and like it. I don't know if it was like the triple A game to make people jump on and buy things, but it existed. Tell Me Why is an interesting game. It's kind of like one of those storytelling, telltale, or Life is Strange type games. They hyped up the return of Battletoads, one of Rare's classic titles. Battletoads was known for being one of the greatest co-op games back in the older NES and Super NES days. So I was looking forward to playing this with my friends and then the game didn't have online co-op, only couch co-op. Really was upset about that, still kind of salty about it. 2021, the Medium released, which was a timed exclusive for six months. Psychonauts 2, a much, much anticipated sequel to the original Psychonauts game, finally was greenlit and came out. And this was a pretty big win for Xbox to finally revive a franchise like this. I don't actually know how well this did sales-wise or Game Pass subscription-wise, but nonetheless, Psychonauts 2 was a really big W. Forza Horizon 5, another, another one. one. Halo Infinite. We've talked about Halo Infinite forever. We know the state of Halo Infinite. The campaign was pretty okay, uh, didn't have co-op, it was lacking a lot of features on the multiplayer side of things, and the content drip on that game has been really rough. But for 2021, the, the two months that Halo Infinite was brand new, it was pretty okay and pretty fun. It, it was a good game for 2021, but it was terrible for the longevity of the franchise and the life of Xbox and Halo moving forward. Microsoft Flight Simulator, which also was a PC release, but this was the first time it came on Xbox. Xbox, and honestly, it was incredibly fun on Xbox also. It technically rolled out in 2021 while the PC side was 2020, but you guys get what I'm saying. This game was really, really fun. I still pick it up from time to time. I'm excited for the follow-up game. Also, it's worth noting this is an Xbox Series SX exclusive because it did not come out or it's not playable on the Xbox One, only if you do the Xbox Cloud thing. And then there was a smaller game called The Ascent. It was like a top-down shooter with some cyberpunk aesthetics. Uh, it was fun for a bit. It got really boring like two hours in and we never went back to it. Okay, there were some other smaller games that were like indie games that would get released or even smaller studio games under Xbox that would release, but they kind of fall into the same category as arcade games. So while we counted stuff like Cuphead on here, just because of how popular that got, we're not gonna mention every single smaller game like Adios or Artful Escape, which are technically Xbox exclusives. 2022, there was a smaller game that was really good and still super under rated if you haven't played it yet, As Dusk Falls, another one of those story-driven games, but the story is really, really good, and it, I just, I don't want to spoil it. If most of you probably haven't played it, go check it out. You're gonna just enjoy like a good four hour chunk of playing this game, and it, it's a it's a fun story. I enjoyed it. There was a game called Pentiment. It was like an adventure RPG developed by Obsidian Entertainment, and uh, they're the people that made Fallout New Vegas and The Outer Worlds. It still felt like a smaller studio rather than another triple A release, and then Crossfire X, which is, I mean, this game came out in 2022, and they already announced it's shutting down or it's already shut down now I guess at this point the game itself was kind of okay it was a counter-strike clone and I guess nobody really wanted to play it so it shut down 15 months after its release wow all right then here we are in 2023 and I don't think there's a lot of games that have been released on the Xbox Series X exclusively there's some big stuff coming out this year I guess we had Redfall um you all know what a disaster that Redfall ended up being but there are some big games coming out later on this year such as Starfield 
and uh, Starfield. I think that's really, uh, really what Microsoft's putting all of their eggs in for this year, but it has been a weird ride nonetheless. There are some exclusives that will be coming out eventually down the road, like Perfect Dark, The Outer Worlds 2, The Elder Scrolls 6, which realistically will probably come out in like the 2030s or something like that. But uh, yeah, this has been pretty telling of the state of Xbox over the years. What do you guys think? Do you think that the lack of games that were exclusive to the Xbox inevitably had some sort of wear and tear on the reputation that Xbox has today? Let us know what your thoughts are in the comments down below. Also, if you enjoyed this video, it's a little different from what we normally do, but I think we want to do more videos like this in the future. Let us know and make sure you're subscribing notifications on. We're covering all types of things now. It's been a lot of fun so far, so we'll just keep on at it. Thanks so much for watching. Huge shout out to our Patreons for supporting our channel. This channel is made possible because of our patrons. So if you want to throw a few bucks our way, check out our Patreon down below. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you all next time with a brand new video.